Oops. Oh, you want me to go? Okay, we're live. We're live. I don't think anyone's on yet. But we're telling your followers that you've started a live video. And welcome to the live um, feed of the Center for Contemporary Printmaking. My name is Liz Banish, and I'm the studio manager and collaborative printer here at the Center. It is my great pleasure to introduce our current artist in residence, Breslin Bell, who has been here for the last few weeks working on a multicolored wallpaper photo lithography project. Uh, and just to introduce Breslin, uh, Breslin Bell is an interdisciplinary visual artist that works primarily in print, sculpture, text, and installation. Additionally, Breslin is an educator and a museum professional. She has exhibited widely since 2016 in a number of group exhibitions, including London, Edinburgh, New York, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Maine, and Japan. Breslin is the recipient of the American Cities Internship Program Award and with the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts the Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop, the Mass Mocha Artist in Residence Program, um, and has completed numerous other artists in residency programs. Belle earned her MFA in printmaking from the Rhode Island School of Design, and her BA in Art History and Studio Art from Wellesley. So without further ado, I'd love to hand it over to Breslin and have her describe a little bit more of her work and what she's been doing while she's been here at CCD. All right, thank you, Liz. Yeah. Hello, everyone, online and in person, IG Live and in person. Um, so, well, first, I just want to thank Liz and also Chris, our camp person, and Kim and the whole CCP team for having me here this past few weeks and uh, welcoming me and letting me sort of realize this project that I've been thinking about for what feels like a very long time. Um, so getting to see it actually in real life has been so wonderful these last few weeks. Uh, maybe before we get to the project that we've been working on and been printing and still like in progress printing, I'll just go through where this project is coming from. So this work is from 2018, so quite a few years ago. And this is sort of representational of where my printmaking practice was at the time 
and how I was working very large scale, which I still am in my, in my current processes. And, and you'll see the work that we're working on here as a wallpaper, so the idea of sort of scaling it up and having it be wall size. But this was like my first large scale installation style print. Um, this work is a lino cut, and now we're working in a plate litho, so different process, um, but similar idea of uh, layering and having this sort of echo narrative of material uh, coming out. And let me see if I can lay this here. Yeah, so that's a, like a slightly better image there for you mm. of the work. And you can see that the work is very uh, plant motifs and thinking about nature and ideas of nature. And I've got this sort of um, group of plants that I work with a lot. Mostly are, they're mostly um, weeds and mm -hmm. plants like already found in nature, or so-called weeds, I guess, is that like sort of derogatory <laughs> term, right. but I really love them. <laughs> um, plants that are fruit bearing, plants that have medicinal purposes, things like that. So. The, and this work is definitely coming from a place of ecofeminism and land body art, but I definitely have a, a maybe strenuous, tense relationship with that category, even though I associate my work with it. I'm also thinking about what that means and sort of like the history of land body art artists and this idea of like land and owner, ownership and property um, kind of a, is a layer on it that I'm still thinking about. Um, but... So moving along, I'm gonna like switch it up here to a few years later. And I'm still working large scale. I'm still working with print and still doing a sort of linoleum process. Pause that there. Um, but the work, the, the content of the work has obviously changed and the look of the work has changed, but still very rooted in um, feminisms as a plural and the idea of like the feminized body. My work is super, has, has become and has been for a while super bodily, but I'm not a figurative artist and I don't do like a, like a person in a painting. So it, it's sort of like the body is, is evoked and the body is there, but not like as a representational force. And what, what is the title of this work? So this work is Bleed. Okay. The title of the work, which is maybe obvious in the in the look of it. Right, yes. <laughs> um, and then skipping down to some related work, just showing, I'm just showing in install shots, not details here, um, to give a sense of the scale because that's very much related to what we're working on now because it's a wallpaper and wallpaper was sort of an avenue for me to think about scale in a different way and think about something being modular and how it could be multiple different scales. So, and then like navigating this TV here. And then fast forward to my first wallpaper and only wallpaper before coming to CCP. Um, this is a 12 inch by 12 inch square to give you an idea of what like the single item of the wallpaper is. And then I'm modulating those out um, and stacking them on the wall together to make whatever size, right? So um, I like the idea of it being modular. It's different from that sort of traditional wallpaper way of thinking where it's a scroll and uh, you're doing these, these big, long, tall, vertical scrolls one right after another and matching them up and there's some overlay and it all is supposed to look seamless in the end, right? But how I'm working is very much um, messing with that narrative, that sort of like domestic, um, from a domestic place narrative. And then when we scale that out here, mm. um, so this is the work installed, and you can see all those little squares. And also having the squares being different colors, that keeps it so that um, you're seeing the seams, right? The seams are sort of emphasized. And the palette here is definitely bodily in the sense that I'm thinking about the various bodily fluids that <laughs> exist in our world and, and mimicking that in the palette. Um, so from this, fast forward a couple years later, coming to CCP and thinking about what I liked about this work and what I would maybe, maybe want to change in the future. And I proposed doing a wallpaper with CCP. Um, 
So it's the same idea. We're actually using the same paper that I used for this work, um, but scaling it up to an 18 inch by 18 inch square rather than a 12 inch by 12 inch square, which I think lets the print live on its own a little bit more, not so modular. Um, also maybe, well, like to be determined, but maybe uh, makes the wee pasting process a little easier. And um, I think just has a, a very different feel. So maybe we'll move over to these works. And we've got all these like examples up here, um, the plates, but sort of thinking about, I mean, I guess we'll look at these to do sort of a demonstration of um, what they'll look like when they're linked up together. Um, so yeah, this work is kind of the marriage of um, that plant, that more like plant-based ecofeminism work that I was doing quite a few years ago, and this more um, like medical or healthcare-based work. So the previous wallpaper had this image um, when you saw like the 12 by 12 inch of these pill packs repeated, and I was and it's titled the pills, like the sort of colloquial the pill as people talk about these like contraceptive pill packs that people have with them. Mm -hmm. Um, so the title of that work was The Pills, and I was very much thinking uh, pretty focused on contraception and the idea of contraception and like feminized people's relationship to contraception. But with this wallpaper, I wanted to branch off of that and think about more broadly this idea of estrogen-related pills and surgeries. So what that means is sort of like covering the breadth of healthcare or what what could be the healthcare of this, this country and, and the world in covering those, um, anything to do with like estrogen and your reproductive system, whether that's hormone replacement therapy or contraception or abortion, which is very topical this week. Um, but I think this work, I mean, this work was obviously in the works before this week and has been a part of my practice for a long time. And I think, I've been thinking a lot in this past week with what's happened about how um, our healthcare as it was, wasn't doing it for me to begin with, like even when Roe was in place, so sort of thinking about how um, we can improve access moving forward. Uh, so the work, literally like what's going on is we've got this like back layer in color, right? Um, so we've got this red and yellow layer, which then make like an orange overlay because we've got some doubling up on the images. And then there's a green outline, outline coming in. And then the final layer is like the plant motifs coming over the top. And I'm sort of thinking about the plant motifs as uh, like a more traditional wallpaper, like these sort of little vignettes of black and white and a very like New England colonial style. And having them as that fourth layer became really important in our process and in our conversation as being the sort of thing over the top and then you see this stuff coming out from underneath and this sort of like undercover feel of these medical products, medical reproductive products. Um, yeah. And you're workshopping a title for this now. Workshopping a title for sure. Um, I don't think I've ever titled anything until it was uh, sort of at a more finalized making process. I'm cautious to say like done, like when something's done. Right. Um, but more finalized uh, making like setting. And we've talked about how uh, not uh, jumping to title it something that's a sort of like protesty or slogany, y mm -hmm. um, because I think this work is talking about more than just what's happening in this current moment, even though what's happening in this current moment is like very applicable to my work and my practice and this wallpaper right here. And yeah, I, my titles in general have a lot of nuance. Um, they're usually like these sort of short little rhyme moments and I like a lot of double meanings in my work and in my title. So I've been thinking a lot about what the double meaning could be in the title for this work. Um, and there's a lot of double meanings within the work and sort of double double usages, I guess, too, because the medical products, a lot of them double 
like re represent multiple estrogen related pills and surgeries, right? So the shot could be various forms of injection, like it could be a contraceptive injection, but it could also be a hormone therapy injection, or it could be um, an injection for PrEP or PEP, which is used for uh, treating HIV AIDS. So it like, sort of like runs the gamut in, in representing, or at least that's my, my hope, mm -hmm. is that these items, which some of them are su super recognizable and some of them are less recognizable, so right. sort of how they can double in their meanings. Um, but then some of them kind of jump right out at you. Right, yeah, and that's what I like so much about this work from the beginning is that, like you said, there are so many objects that kind of feel ubiquitous in the medical field and maybe don't have like an association with them that's political or whatsoever or gender coded, but um, there's obviously objects in here that are very somewhat gender coded mm -hmm. and maybe even beyond their application, but and I know you kind of strayed away from the usual medical suite of colors. Yeah. But a lot of the way these items can be peddled to people in their packaging, in their messaging, is also very gender coded. Oh yeah. Meaning that they're pushed towards specific genders. Um, yeah, yeah. Like the pill packs, for example, I've definitely seen advertising that has them always as like pink or any kind of type of contraceptive is that like pink, very like gender color, which I stray away from in my work, and then also the blue, like the pink and blue, but also blue is like a, like a sort of medical blue, and, and I don't use a lot of blue in my work, so, and I, and I think with the color palette, we had talked about having it be these sort of earthy colors to mimic the plant imagery, but it's like switched, like right. the plants are in black and white, and then the medical imagery takes on this sort of like natural, um, necessary, always there, always needed energy is kind of my thinking palette. Right, so removing it from the commodification of it. Yeah, the branding. Giving it the ubiquitousness of nature. Yeah, that was that was a difficult part in the design process was this idea of branding because um, these little circle moments are pills like medications but there's so many different looks for every type of medication. And like I said, I wanted those double meanings, so I wanted the pills to be representative of multiple um, needs or reasons why a person would take a medication daily or monthly or emergency after a situation, um, what have you. So I kind of went for a more graphic, generic type pill than actually like marking it with the lettering or the symbol that comes in the, with these brand names. Right, can yeah. you can imagine trying to brand these particular products in these colors? Yeah. And how that would be received by the public. Because mm -hmm. you say yourself that you stray away from colors that are, I guess, aesthetically pleasing, which tend to be colors that are less natural, mm -hmm. those ones. Mm -hmm. um, so just like, yeah, I guess a little behind the scenes is, you know, um, while working with Reslin, we discovered very quickly that she is not interested in any colors without a little brown added to them, more or less. Basically. Um, yeah, basically, whether it be red, pink, yellow, it's always being pushed a little bit more towards the neutral and dirtied off a little bit with the complementary color, mm -hmm. because having that pure jewel, jewel tone or something that's a little bit too pastel is getting away from sort of Yes, the illustrative content of the work. Which you and Chris were very accommodating of because that definitely makes a printer's job more complex when you can't just use the color straight out of the, <laughs> out of the tin. No one wants a color out Which rarely <laughs> happens anyway. But yeah, but yeah this, there's a, there was a lot of tweaking and a lot of uh, a lot of test strips. Right. So. Um, but we always knew we arrived at a color when there was a somewhat physical reaction to the, oh, yeah. to the mix. Yeah. Which definitely relates to how I think about my audience and my audience experiencing the work. So I think there's two main things that I think about. One is with the size of the work, because I have been working so large scale recently, I'm thinking about that sort of dual reaction. So the work will look much differently from far away as it will close up. And that's true for this work as well, mm -hmm. especially if it's going to live on a wall as a wallpaper covering a whole wall it's going to look very abstract from far away, right? And then you get up close and you can see all those little details and the line work and maybe even identify what each 
item is or each plant is um, and, and make your own decisions about that and thoughts about that. Um, and then the other thing is more about um, the reaction, not shock value at all, not interested in shock value, but more that just sort of because I'm thinking of things as so bodily, even though I'm not representing the, the like the human body, that sort of like, ooh, reaction of like a bodily fluid or a product and sort of having that uh, raw conversation about, and like honesty, I guess, about mm -hmm. our body. Because there's, I mean, there's a lot of, in society, we could go on and on about how um, certain bodies don't get to be talked about or don't get to be, um, like things associated with those bodies aren't welcome in like society conversation. So mm -hmm. maybe putting that on its head a little bit. Right, absolutely. Um, because like the discussion being that, you know, I think people have that reaction because they, it's like a somewhat sympathetic reaction because they think of themselves yeah. Like relative to the color of lymph or the color of blood, and that sort of gives them the yeah, it's, like, it's a human reaction on some level, right? Yeah. Right. But then also maybe a, a gendered reaction. Absolutely, absolutely, cases. for sure. Um, so that being said, uh, you know, when you were thinking about the composition and just about starting this work in general, um, what what brought you here? like to this composition and to this image? To the composition? Like what were you thinking about? Um, well, I knew I wanted to represent, so the pill pack is like here, you can see these like circles, very like obvious, and I'm using them as my sort of corner anchor points for mm -hmm. when I'm doing the, the wee pasting up, that's my little cheat there. Um, so the pill packs is like coming from that previous wallpaper and other prints that I've made with that right. imagery. Um, and then it was just like a lot of research <laughs> to get, to figure out what I wanted to include and what I didn't want to include and how present I wanted things to be. Um, and we had a lot of conversations and a lot of push and pull over the sizing of things, the scaling of things, and then you have to bring in the plants and in relationship to the plants, how do you want everything to be scaled? Um, the plants are definitely, I think, slightly larger mm -hmm. than everything on this sheet or like on this layer, on this level, mm -hmm. um, but then they're also in black and white outline, so it's easier for like the stuff to pop through mm -hmm. from the back. Um, and then they also have ample space. You can see like around this dandelion, there's a lot of space before you hit other plants, whereas here everything's a little bit tighter, um, and then you've got the pills sort of populating whatever negative space happens. Yeah. Um, and I was using Procreate, which is to, to like make the digital file, which is a program that makes it really easy to make a repeating pattern so that everything links up at the seams and it's a lot of sort of moving the image around to get to the edges and, and basically fill it all in is the goal. Have it be even. Mm -hmm. As far as the content of the work, what were you thinking about? So, I was thinking a lot about a lot of things and reading a lot of things, and this is, like I said, like a few years in the making, even though we're like realizing it into life the past couple weeks. Um, I have a little blurb, if you want to snag it for me. I'll just read it to the group. Um, this is a little blurb from Emmy Koyama's Trans Feminist Manifesto, which was first written in 2001, so a long time ago, and maybe there's some bits that we could update and how we um, speak about people or speak about gender today, but I think it still holds true um, on the sort of relationship between trans feminism and the right to choose. Um, so I'm just gonna read this little blurb. It may seem ironic that trans women who in general have no capacity for bearing children would be interested in the women's reproductive rights movement but trans feminism sees a deep connection between the liberation of trans women and women's right to choose. First of all, society's stigmatization of trans existence is partly due to the fact that we mess with our reproductive organs. Non-genital cosmetic surgeries are performed far more frequently than sex reassignment surgeries, yet they do not require months of mandatory psychotherapy, nor are the ones who pursue cosmetic surgeries ridiculed and scorned daily on national broadcast trash talk shows. Such hysteria over our personal choices is fueled in part by society's taboo against self-determination of our reproductive organs. 
Like women seeking an abortion, our bodies have become an open territory, a battleground. Additionally, the hormones that many trans women take are similar in origin and chemical composition to what trans non-trans women take for birth control, emergency contraception, and hormone replacement therapy. As trans women, we share their concerns over safety, cost, and availability of these estrogen-related pills. And that's like the, the blurb that I'm taking there. Mm. Um, trans and non-trans women need to be united against the right-wing tactics aimed at making means and information to control our bodies unavailable if not illegal. Um, yeah. Which hits home this past week. Right. But I'm definitely snapping out that estrogen-related pills and I've sort of been talking about this work as estrogen-related pills and surgeries and I'm expanding it out to include both in one phrase um, and just how those services that is like healthcare and like between a doctor and the, um, and the person needing the pill or the surgery, um, how that has been, I don't know, regulated. Yes. More and more it seems. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of expansive conversation around this relative to access of healthcare and why certain pockets of healthcare get, you know, kind funding. of funding. Yes, funding or affordability. Or affordability. <laughs> yeah. Or you know why, for some reason, even though they all include the human body, mm -hmm. many different bodies, mm -hmm. they have to be shoehorned into these categories yeah. that require different regulation from everything else. Sometimes even different levels of insurance coverage to yeah. cover individual parts. Yep. Um, so absolutely, and and just the difference right down to something that is preventative versus something that is emergency. So like you, in contraception, you can think of like the pill or the many other ways that you can have like preventative contraception. But then you have like Plan B um, or abortion, which could be the abortion pill, which is actually two pills, um, like crystal and mitral crystal or um, an in-clinic surgery, and the, the sort of differences between those and access, affordability, legality, mm -hmm. um, as, of, as of yet, and how, and that, that's mirrored in, for example, um, with HIV AIDS treatment, there's PrEP and PEP, which are like two different medications, and one is the more preventative, so like you take it daily and it, and it protects you and then one is more of an acts as an emergency um where you like take it after like post post exposure is literally the in the name so oh, interesting <laughs> kind of a making term almost yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah and i think you know this amalgamation of these items in this way in this presentation helps this idea like we're saying you know it's an almost arbitrary decision to consider something an emergency versus preventative because it's all preventative. It, it's like all necessary for the whole process yeah. of protection. Right. From whether we're talking, whatever we're talking about. Yeah, you need the protection, like preventative and emergency. Yeah. Right. Right. So it's all the same yeah. healthcare, and it, yeah, and the access and the should be ubiquitousness be. is the yes, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, this has been um, a really great project to work on. This, uh, it's been, you know, not without its sort of, you know, it's a foil lithography project, so yeah, it's not without its, you know, troubleshooting, shall we say. I want to give a little attention to the plates. Yeah, yeah. give some love to the plates here. Um, so you can see how the image was divided. We have three plates here, and the fourth for the plants is actually getting inked at the moment because we're still in, in the middle of production. But we have here the red plate, the yellow, um, and you'll notice that, especially on the pill caps, the red and the yellow are registered to each other, so that, that creates the orange hue that you see there, yeah. so that we're getting three colors Very subtle. from the two plates. So we have like a subtle kind of hue shift here. Um, and then this plate here is our green outline that gives all of the, it just tightens up all the delineations of the individual pill and the object hood of the individual shapes. Which like, like can be a registration problem, but it's more a registration solution because it kind of like cinches up all the, all the shapes. Right. And everything was pin registered and punched to themselves. So that's how we did our registration here. 
Um, the paper is called Crane's Letra, which is something you have worked with before. Yeah, just paper. Just on that paper. Um, Good for wheat pasting. Right, right. So Reslin likes to use the Crane's Letra paper because it's good for wheat pasting. The image or the paper can withstand heavy treatment of the wheat paste goo uh, without stretching or compromising the structure of the paper. And um, so when you're picturing this work as the final product, you said you you know the individual prints can hold their own, but the ultimate goal is to have them as a yeah. large wheat pasted wall installation. Yeah, yeah, and. Thinking of it as like a wheat pasted wall installation is like less and less thinking of it as a wallpaper, right? And again, when thinking like installing a wallpaper in this modular way, like square by square, where it's usually in these rolls, like for domestic uses, um, is sort of like undermining that like domestic idea of wallpaper. Um, and then also, if and when like when this is wheat pasted, similar to the previous uh, like twelve by twelve squares that I wheat pasted, it's ephemeral. So I wheat pasted up for the show, the exhibition, um, whatever I'm installing it for, and then I scrape it off the wall. <laughs> it's destroyed, um, which is maybe stressful for some people, but I really enjoy that process, and I really enjoy that sort of like repetitive, laborious pacing it up and then like scraping it away as like part of the work. Um, so I think that also undermines this idea of it being a wallpaper, and then also just thinking about like wheat paste culture and sort of like street art culture and having it be like more in that vein and in that style, that sort of aesthetic, than having it be um, these roles that I like take down cleanly at the end. Right, right, right. Yeah. So the destruction is part of yeah. the life cycle of the work itself. Yeah. So will this be kind of the first wallpaper that you created that will have parts that might live on as individual pieces? Yes, I think so. Um, I mean, I have leftovers because obviously you want to make more squares than you need for the wall because <laughs> there's always situations of the last one. Um, but this one, especially because I'm here with CCP and we're working in this way, there'll be ones that I leave behind with CCP um, and then ones that sort of can live on their own and be like framed as singular prints. And that was part of the design process and part of the printing process is like thinking of how they can live in that way, but also live in a, in a modular wallpaper way, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of cool that it has like this dual life and this dual usage or utility in a way. Mm -hmm. And the same way that a lot of these instruments do. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Um, yeah, is there anything else uh, you'd like to share about this work or about your experience here or about the future? and where you're headed in your artistic direction? Um, I think we've covered like, the content of the work. I'm trying to think if there's anything left like very printmaking specific mm -hmm. um, because we're at CCP. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything. Like, can you imagine a lot of your projects taking on the printed form more in the future? Because you are an interdisciplinary artist. I am. Yeah, so I was like trained in printmaking and that's definitely like my first love. And what I continue to do, yeah, you're all, but you're all biased. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm also a sculptor, a sculptor um, and I make sculptures and I also work with glass a little bit and I've also been heavily into video. So definitely I'm um, running the gambit and working into that interdisciplinary space, which I really enjoy. Um, but I think in the future, I mean, definitely continuing printmaking. Um, I'll just say that. <laughs> and then, um, interested in combining those things because I think they're they're combined in my mind as well as, as far as like how I work as an artist in the studio and how I think about process and how I think about repetition and layering. Like that's very much a part of printmaking, but I use that as a skill in my sculpture work. So I think moving forward, maybe how the mediums can cross over and something can be. I don't really use the word mixed media, but like that sort of like layering of media, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, not to be like, but I think like CCP has like made me like think about printmaking more. Like I think it's, it's part, obviously like part of my practice just because I've been here for a few weeks working on it. Um, but I think the ideas are, are moving about printmaking specifically just with like, I mean, I hadn't done a lot of photo litho 
even though I have a lot of printmaking experience, that wasn't a, a huge part of it. I did a lot of stone litho, but not a lot of uh, plate litho. So getting to gain skills in plate litho mm -hmm. makes me want to work with it more, obviously. So mm -hmm. yeah, just grabbing those skills as I go. <laughs> yes, yes, which is as you should. Yeah. Um, well, great. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, this has been so fun. Red Lizard has had a couple days left, um, and we are just finishing up getting a BAT done and um, just making sure that Red Lizard gets home safely after all this is done. We'll have plenty more additioning to do once she leaves, but we're excited about um, having this finished work as a result of this of this new residency program that we just started. Um, that um, is a application-based, fully funded residency um, that will happen in subsequent summers. So it's something to keep your eyes peeled on in the future. But otherwise, um, if you want to know more about Breslin, where can they find you? Uh, my website or Instagram, live. Yeah. <laughs> <On Instagram. laughs> um, which I think I'm connected to CCP at this point. So right. through, through your website or Instagram. Okay, so we'll put Redland's contact info on the information for this video when we post it to YouTube. This video will be available on YouTube after we finish recording and we upload it. And thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.